We left off at verse 4. The Bible says marriage is honorable in all, meaning that God, He sees marriage as something honorable to everybody. Now, remember, I'm going to be explaining each and every word from the verse. So remember that. Keep that in mind. The reason why I'm doing that is to make sure that you understand every word in that verse. So a lot nowadays people say the Bible is too hard to understand, but I want, you, want to show you from these Bible studies that it's not as hard as you think. So make sure you pay attention and see if my explanation matches up with the verse. That will help you grow more in understanding the words. The Bible says, and the bed undefiled. So the bed where the husband and wife sleep at, God sees that as nothing defiling, nothing corrupt, nothing filthy. He sees that as clean. For whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. However, outside of the marriage bed, what well, God sees that as something defiling, unclean and filthy. He calls those people whoremongers, those who are not married but have premarital sex, adulterers, those who uh, cheat on their spouse. God considers that as something very serious that he's going to judge. What's very interesting is that when the Bible lists uh, a bunch of sins, people who will lose the inheritance, uh, lose their rewards, he always mentions sexual sins in there. So he always mentions sexual sins. This is a sin that has been, uh, that, sorry, my mind's not uh, in place today, so I might be fumbling a bit. But this sin has been ever since from the beginning of time. So this is a sin that all of us has to be wary of. But notice that this is a so-called sin in modern society today. They take it very lightly. They, they experiment with it. They think that everybody should do it. It's not a big deal. But this is a very serious sin that God says that he's going to judge. Now, uh, the, the mistaken thought of people is that they think that something sexual is something filthy and something sinful. Actually, it is not. You'll notice that in verse 4, God says it's honorable to everybody and it's uncorrupted. Uh, it's not corrupted to him because this is something that God ordained. I mean, after all, uh, what do you think Adam and Eve did, you know, if they're going to produce children, right? <laughs> so that's something God created, God designed. That's what we're biologically made to be. But see, that's the mistaken thought from modern society is that because this is a biological instinct, hence I can do whatever I want with it. Well, then you ever wondered why there's STDs and AIDS and all that. So that shows that's not normal, okay? That shows that's something that's, uh, that you should be wary of. In other words, there are boundaries within how we perform sex. There's boundaries. What's the boundary? The marriage bed. The verse 4 already told you. So marriage bed is the only safe zone that God considers clean, that's not corrupted, and that's honorable to everybody. When uh, people hear about sex, or Christians, or even lost people, they assume that Christians are prude, that sex is, you know, something filthy, and that we cannot do, blah, blah, blah. But no, God says it's very honorable, it's very clean. Outside of the marriage bed, that's where judgment hits. That's where filth is. Now, when we talk about uh, the marriage bed here, let's go to 1 Corinthians 7. 1 Corinthians 7. And then I want you to also go to the book of 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. Now, God, he believes that sex is an important thing. It is even a need. It is even a need. This is our biological instinct. However, it should be within the boundaries of marriage. Well, why can't I do it wherever my body wants to? Well, you see the repercussion of that, right? This is the kind of mess that we have. And then that's why you can't distinguish genders anymore. And you don't even know what color that you have on the flag. I guarantee they, they don't even see color on the flag. That's how bad it is. 
So if you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 7, God actually sees that the devil can use lack of sex as, uh, for his advantage. Now that might be shocking to some people, but that is actually a truth. If there is a uh, lack of sex, that's something the devil can take advantage of. You might say, why? Because it's part of a biological mechanism, biological need. So if the body does not receive that, what do you think is going to happen? That's what I'm going to show you in 1 Timothy 4. All right, but let's look at 1 Corinthians 7 first. The Bible says in verse 5, to the wife and husband. Verse 4, notice the wife and the husband do not have power over their own body. Uh, wives, your body actually belong to the husband, and husband, your bodies actually belong to the wives. They're not your own. You might say, why? Because it's called marriage. So the bodies uh, belong to each other. So the verse is saying in verse 5, defraud ye not one the other. Now that's pretty serious. Notice how what God sees right here is that if you don't give your body to the one you love, then he calls that defrauding. That's pretty serious. So notice right here that God, the world thinks that Christians are prudent regarding sex, but God sees that lack of sex within marriage is defraud. Uh, he says right here, except it be with consent for a time, why is there a consent to not give in to each other with sex? That ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer. Now, there's an interesting passage in Exodus uh, when God was going to meet with the Jews in the camp. And he actually says to, for, the men, for the husbands and wives not to sleep with each other. So, with, regarding uh, fasting and prayer, spending time with God, something holy, where you, why? Because you're giving yourself to the Lord. When you're giving up yourself to the Lord, then that's something where uh, sex has no play in it. And come together again. But the author writes again, you got to get back together again. Why? You cannot lock yourself up as a monastery and say, I give my body to the Lord. See, uh, that's something that you hear a lot of Catholic uh, monasteries uh, talk about. No, that's, that verse says, the last part of verse 5, that Satan tempts you not for your incontinency. That's serious. That way the devil don't tempt you. In other words, for pleasure, incontinency. That's the idea. It relates to pleasure there. But uh, when we look at 1 Timothy 4, notice it is a doctrine of the devil when people forbid you to marry. Now, notice that the priesthood, they do, they do that. And God says, actually, no, that is a doctrine of the devil, believe it or not. So look at 1 Timothy chapter 4, and then we'll look at verse 3. Verse 3, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats, kind of like Friday, right? What they do, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. This is a doctrine of the devil because notice in verse 1, read verse 1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter time some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. And then verse 3 shows the context of that. Now in 1 Corinthians 7, uh, I forgot to mention this part. God recognizes, I mean look, the, this world is so wicked that they... Uh, Put no boundaries in sex. You notice that? If you don't put a boundary in sex, you are sick, sorry to say. And you will cause all kinds of corruption and filth. Sorry to say, but that is the truth. Okay? Amen, First Corinthians, but this does not mean that God forbids sex either. Why? Because he knows, I mean, the liberals are right. Okay? God uh, understands that this is a biological mechanism. A need. But to put no boundary in it is you're asking for catastrophe and disasters to happen. So it's got to be within boundaries. What's the boundary? The boundary is the bed right here, the marriage bed. So God, He actually approves it, He actually recommends it. It's a recommendation. If you don't do it, then what's going to happen? 
then the devil is going to take advantage of it. And what is the devil going to do when your body does not receive what it needs? Oh, can you guess? I don't have to tell you, all right? I don't need to tell you. But the devil, he could sure take, uh, attack it. That's why he wants to attack the home. That's the reason why adultery and divorce is so rampant. You ever wondered why? You ever wondered why about that? Because there's no faithfulness with these two. So the devil, he takes advantage of it. And if... Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, I'm not saying that everybody has to have sex or everybody has to get married. Obviously, that's not what I'm saying. It is a biological need, but there are some people who are able to live with it, to be single. And there's nothing wrong with that, okay? There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, actually, the Apostle Paul says if you're able to do that, serving God by yourself, more power to you, actually. That's what the Bible says. But it's when... Different religions and churches forbid preachers to get married because their body only belongs to the Lord. That's hogwash. I tried that, all right? <laughs> no, I couldn't do it. I was like, Lord, get me a wife. <laughs> I tried that, all right? Didn't work. How do I know it didn't work? Because everybody <laughs> in my church was praying for me to get married because they could probably see for themselves. <laughs> That's how bad it was, you know. I was like, no, I'm okay. And they're like, no, you're not okay. You know? <laughs> All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse uh, 9. But if they cannot contain, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn. That's pretty much self-explanatory. You can guess what that means. Uh, people, uh, there are people out there that they just can't control themselves. And uh, the sexual need and desire is in there. So it is better to marry than to burn, the Bible says. So a few lessons right here that we've learned is that sex is recommended, all right? That sounds like taboo. That sounds like a Christian shouldn't say. But to be quite often, I think this should be said because, if, because the Lord gave you a protective factor from the devil taking advantage with you on other dark stuff. All right, so this is a protective factor. If the husband's not uh, doing it with the wife, the wife's not doing it with the husband, then the devil's going to slip in something and you better watch out. So be careful of that. That's why there's a lot, uh, the devil, he sure takes advantage with a lot of filth growing. So again, what we've learned to summarize everything, uh, sex is not a sin. It's not something that liberals say, oh, you Christians are such prude and then you condemn sex. No, that's not the case. The Bible recommends it. Number two, it's recommended so much to the point that you've got to do it or the devil will take advantage of it. So the devil will take advantage of it. Number three, if you don't have sex and you're able to live with it by yourself, great, more power to you, okay? But if you're married, don't mistake it to think that, let's say one person says, well, I can do it without sex. Well, no, then you're defrauding the other person. See? So you got to realize marriage is a two, a two thing. So you have to be considerate to each other. And you can't expect the other person to have sex with you if you're not loving to the person too. That's a real thing. Okay? So uh, this is an important thing that the devil has used to attack marriage homes. And you wonder why everyone divorces, why everyone sexually experiments. You know why in Hollywood it's so crazy that um, they don't get married till 40s and stuff like that? That's a real thing. I'll tell you the answer. Everybody's stinking selfish. That's why. So they're using this gift from God improperly, what they're created and made to be. All right, let's go to Hebrews uh, 13. Or among us adulterers, God will judge. So God takes that very seriously, and he will judge you. He will condemn you. All right, verse 5. Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as ye have. So the verse is saying, from your conversation, from your speech, from what you say, 
there shouldn't be any covetousness in there. Make sure that you're content with the things that you do have in your life. Uh, as I read that passage, conversation uh, goes in two ways here. There's two meanings here. One is that uh, conversation is obviously from what you say. However, conversation is also from your manner of living, manner of life, your everyday living. Now, Hebrews 13, verse 4 and 5, is really condemning American culture. Amen. Yeah, amen, amen. I got to hear amens on that one. This, this American culture is just so messed up in the head that you get too many broken ho homes. In fact, you got to realize this. It, how can you live in a society and culture where divorce is accepted as a norm for successful home living? Do you understand what I'm saying here? They're not saying that, but they put that in our minds, didn't they? It's like a norm now within families. And they expect that they can have good relationship with kids, spouses, and their everyday healthy mental well-being when there's a divorce. This is bad. This is very serious. And it relates to verse 5, where we live in a culture of covetousness. No, America, which is probably one of the number one nations that has everything, how can we covet? For a country who has everything, we're sure spoiled and rotten, we covet. I, you got everything. I, this is, it's a sick society that we live in. I'm sorry to use wording like that, but I'm just, it shows me how much anger that I have in the country that we live in, in our society. It twisted our minds now that this is all a norm thing, to covet, to fornicate, to, you know, all these kind of norms. When God already set the specific boundary and lines of successful family living and a happy life, we just ruin it all to pieces with our sins. So verse 5, I'm actually going to park more than verse 4. Verse 5 is a huge number one factor. And by the way, uh, you wouldn't commit the sexual sins in verse 4 without covetousness anyway. This is a huge factor, covetousness. So let me kick against this sin for one, all right? First go to Luke chapter 12, all right? Or is it Luke 16? Excuse me, Luke 16. You better be careful of covetousness because a lot of you don't know it. When I was thinking about this passage, I'm like saying to myself, well, I don't know if, um, not often do I catch myself uh, saying stuff out of my mouth where I'm coveting something. However, when I start to think about it more and more on my own actions and my own way of living, uh, Luke 6, not 16, excuse me, Luke chapter 6, sorry. I started to reflect on the way that I talk to people and the way that I talk about things in life. Um, let's say you're talking about uh, certain favorite TV shows that you watched or an advertisement that you saw, or you're looking at um, some building that you're touring or some sites and you're going, wow, that's beautiful. Wow, that's spectacular. You talk about your favorite sports team and then the characters in some TV show. I realize more and more when I start to introspect myself and others when they talk about that, why are they excited about talking about those things? Usually people identify themselves with the sports team or with the characters or with the advertisement or the stuff that they say. They identify themselves with that. What a lot of people don't realize that unconsciously, when you're identifying yourself with that, that means there's something you like about that character. You like about that advertisement. You like about that sports team that you want for yourself. So let's say you don't get that for yourself. Then that contributes a lot to depression within people. 
because uh, they think that the joy and the excitement is what they watch on TV quite often. And then when they see that's all their joy and their excitement, then in their real life that they live in, yeah. you wonder why they're very discontent and not happy. That shows me right there unconsciously, their joy factors are what the TV shows rather than their real life. What's that? Then that's covetousness. That's an unconscious covetousness that's going on. Uh, you know, when you go shopping, and when you see stuff on TV and the video games that you play, covetousness is an easy sin that slips in the unconscious mind without you knowing. If you don't believe that, uh, my question to you is why are you depressed then with your real life, the things that you do have in life? Why aren't you happy, content with the real things that you have in life? I guarantee you this, friend. If you saw yourself, if this real life that you're living in is the richest life that you're living and you see other people who don't have it as best as you do or who live more poorly than you do, you would treasure and value what you have. But I know why you're still depressed and sad is because there's something you compare yourself to. Oh, poor unfortunate you because you're going through suffering. You're going through this pain and that pain. Well, not if there are people in pain worse than you. If everyone in the world is in worse pain than you, you'd be thankful for the current pain that you got. But see, the reason why you're not thankful for the current pain that you got is because you see more healthier people than you out there. People who have less pain than you. Okay, do you know why you don't like your house that you live in? You don't like the possessions that you have? Because you think there's something better out there. Now, is this making any sense here? This is hitting home here. This is a number one sin factor that I want to kick really hard against because this has become now a norm in American culture. Hey, we kick hard against sexual sins being the norm, but this thing has definitely become the norm within us American Christians. Now, why am I kicking this so hard? Because I'm an American too. I was born in America. And I wouldn't kick so hard against sin if I didn't realize that I struggled with it too. Covetousness is a huge sin here. It's a huge sin. A lot of us don't realize it, that we're living in that. So when you're talking excitedly about some place or something you saw or something that you watch, you have to be careful of that because a lot of the stuff that you say may be covetousness without you knowing. You got to be careful of that. You might say, why is that? Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Luke chapter 6. All right. Luke chapter 6. Covetousness is always in the heart. All right. It always starts from the heart. You think you hide it real good, but be careful because uh, what, what's in your heart cannot be hidden forever. Let me repeat that again. What you covet in the heart, you cannot hide it forever. It's going to come out of your mouth. How is it going to come out of your mouth? Oh, your complaints, for example. Your, de your depressed words might come out. Something that you love will come out. But those things could be, those words that come out of your mouth could be cloaks and disguises of what you're really feeling in the heart, which is covetousness. I, I don't know if that made any sense to you, any of you, but Luke chapter 6, verse 45. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil. For of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaketh. Look, all that covetousness you have in your heart is going to come out of your mouth. You can't hide it. You can't, it's going to come out one way or the other. It's going to come out through excitement of your favorite team or your favorite character or your favorite thing that you like. It's going to come out through complaint about your own current life or your own current situation. Amen, yeah, amen, amen, amen. Go, let's go back to Hebrews 13. Now, I'm not done kicking this, but actually uh, I got some good news about this too now. All right, some real... Come on. Now, uh, one more thing to warn about Conversation is manner of living, correct? Yeah. 
So here's something to think about regarding manner of life with covetousness. If you're to think about your life, okay, you might think you might not have a covetousness problem because it didn't come out of your mouth. But my question to you is this. We live in a, a society that has too many things. Too many things. So that's why we covet so easily. It's really, really bad. When you ask yourself, are you really living happy with your life? The question is, why aren't you happy then? Uh, I believe a huge number one factor is because of covetousness. I believe depression, complaint, a lot of the things, negative things that you go through in life is from covetousness. And when you live your life, listen, when your whole manner of living is coveting, 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 someone who has better health than you, somebody who's able to do more things for the Lord than you do, somebody who has more fruits than you do, um, somebody who has more stuff than you do, somebody who has a happier marriage life than you, if there is such a thing, there is no such thing. But anyway, who has a better, uh, who has a better house than you, better family life, blah, 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 blah all this kind of stuff. When you live your life believing that there's something better out there than what you currently have, you have a miserable life. You don't want to let waste, let, let me repeat this, don't waste your whole life living like that. That's a waste. When the Lord started to I mean, uh, a lot of you know the hard times that I go through, but I realized uh, more and more how much of a beautiful life that I got and how blessed I am. Mm -hmm. Perhaps the people who watch me online don't think like that because they're watching TV, right? Yeah. And they think that my life is just great, you know, but the people who know me in person know what kind of a uh, lot of sacrifices and pain that I had to go through. But um, the more and more I thought... Uh, thought about my life in spite of the sacrifice and pain, the more and more I realize how beautiful my life is and how much of my life that I'm wasting. I mean, there's so much in my life that I can do, that I can use, that I can enjoy, even in my own, uh, the things that I have in my home. I mean, how much junk do we collect in storage room that we never touched, see? There's just way too much that we have that we can enjoy. We're just not taking advantage of it. Maybe someday you ought to look at your storage space, your junk space, and then do a little shopping there, huh? Enjoy. You want your shopping time, ladies? Go to your junk. <laughs> Go to your storage and then enjoy a shopping moment and then just do a little fashion show in front of a mirror or, you know, do window shopping and enjoy it, all right? It's yours after all. Now, uh, that there's a lot of truth in this. The truth, I mean, do you know why people are wasting so much time in TV and video games now? That's a life that they want to have that they'll never have. Do you want to live your life, waste your whole life, manner of living, fantasizing, yeah. or really living it? Yeah, amen. Yeah, amen. Why, why is the one brother here going to drive three and a half hours all the way to our place, you know? Because he's going to use every moment of his life yeah. best as he can to live it. Amen. And boy, he's got a life, hasn't he? That's right. He probably has more friends than I do around the States now. You know, <laughs> he's going to so many meetings, you know. You know what that is? Not wasting life. <laughs> Living every day to the fullest that you can. That's why we're doing this church trip. It's a wonderful thing. But to be honest, I think that uh, I would encourage more of you to go out more often. The worst place you can be is stuck inside your home. That's right. And then just doing your necessary things. Work, eat, stay in your house and sleep and die. <laughs> Don't do it that way, man. What a waste. Go out more often. You know, uh, Look at the things that you do have in your home that you've been neglecting or your family or what God blessed you. Get more involved in church. You know why? Not because we're, try, uh, we're trying to get you to work. Yeah. It's, you do know this. Come on. It's every moment of your life. And one of the best memories you had is in this local church that you had. Amen. Do you know how many people are watching us that are coveting? Uh, wow, that's good, brother. Come on. And a lot of you watching us online, you don't know uh, the people in our church, how bad that they've got it too.
You think they all have it great, but you don't know how bad that they got it. And those of you who are attending my church, you don't realize how good you got it here, yeah. that people are coveting what you got. Yeah, you're right, brother. Yeah. What am I trying to hit at? I'm trying to hit against this sin that's causing us so much misery. Yes, you want to really live it. That's what I would do if I were you. Now, uh... Why should we be able to live it happily? Because this is, I love this verse. You ready? This is the answer, guys. This is the answer. Read the next part of verse 5. You know why you can, uh, the solution for covetousness is contentment. So be thankful for what you have. Now, you heard that quite often. But why? What good reason can you have with contentment? As a matter of fact, I'm going to show you how powerful this is that no matter how miserable your life is, this is such a very powerful factor, okay? That'll help you. Contentment is the solution against covetousness. This is what you and I want to have that will cancel out the sin of covetousness. All right, how can I be content? The reason why you can be content is because the last part of that verse, it says... Be content with such things as he have, for he has said, because, see, there's your answer. Because Jesus said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Amen. Because Jesus Christ will never leave you. He'll never abandon you. He'll always be with you. Did you hear what I said? Come on. I don't think any of you got this in your heads yet. Jesus Christ is with you, which is why you can be satisfied with your everyday life. See, we don't understand what that means. Okay, Jesus is with me, so what, right? Jesus is with me, so what? Do you understand who you got? Uh, go to 1 Corinthians 3. This is one of the verses that we memorized a long time ago. 1 Corinthians 3. You know what you got? You got Jesus. He fills up the whole universe. He, he's the one that gives you what you have today. He owns everything. Now, if I got Jesus Christ, I should be content then. I should be satisfied. I got everything that I need. That's why I can be happy. Thank God he didn't give me things that I wanted, but gave me things that would make me happy. Why? Because if he spoiled me, you ever seen spoiled people? You think they're happy? It causes more of a detriment. Even with pain that uh, I go through in life, I still got Jesus, and God knows that that could be for my betterment. So let's go to 1 Corinthians 3. Verse 21, verse 21. Therefore let no man glory in men. For what? All things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present, or things to come, all are yours. Why do you own everything? Because, and ye are Christ, and Christ is God's. Amen. That's the reason why you and I can be content. We can be happy, because we have Jesus Christ. <laughs> Guys, do you, I know that our church, we went through a lot. Don't get me wrong, okay? We go through a lot. Some are still going through a lot. Maybe most of you are. A lot of people who watch us don't realize um, what kind of struggles and pain or battles that we all go through. But do you realize that the best is yet to come for our church? Aren't we excited? I mean, I, uh, if there's one thing I can promise this church, which I promised my wife. So with this church, I can't promise you a lot of good stuff, but I can promise you one thing. You will not be bored when you attend my church. Yeah. I promise you, if you attend our church for several years, you're going to have a lot of excitement, a lot of things happen. It'll be one of the most exciting things that will happen in your lives. Amen. Haven't we had that the, uh, the past, uh, ever since COVID, haven't we had that? Yeah. And then, you know, see, always seeing new things, right? Yeah. You explore new things too. Ain't that exciting? That's right. It's exciting what we have. We definitely have it made. The Lord's been very good to us. 
So the manner of life then, notice right here, is contentment. When your everyday living is, I am satisfied with Jesus Christ, think about how your life's going to end then. You end satisfied. Now, how many of you want to end your day tonight satisfied? We all moan and groan and our trial tribulate. Look, 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 look. If there's something I want, this, is, this will help change your whole life. It will make you very happy. End your day satisfied. End your day satisfied, not miserable. Well, I don't have this. I don't have that. See, that's covetousness then. Think about what you do have, what you can use that you can end satisfied. I mean, there's nothing like a day. Think about this. There's nothing like a day where you go outside and the sun is hitting on you and you're holding a sign and you're preaching the gospel and you try to tell somebody how to get saved and they scoff you and mock at you. They let you down and then uh, you come to church, you sing hymns and then you see your brother and sister in Christ and you go back home and you end the night with sleep, satisfied with fellowship with the brethren being mocked for Jesus Christ, Amen. trying to give the gospel out, and singing praises to his name. I think that was a good Wednesday, don't you think so? Amen. Is this a waste of time? No. I'll tell you what, you come to street preaching, you come to this church, you come to singing, you come to prayer meeting, and you go back home, and you moan and groan, oh, it's been so tiring, you know, and then, oh, another day, you wasted your Wednesday. I like to preach on that. I, like, I, I think this, I should preach on this Sunday. Yeah, I think, because, you know why? Because this has become our norm now. This miserable living. This covetous living. That's why I'm very angry and I want to preach hard against this because this made you and I miserable all day long. I want you to go back home tonight satisfied and think that you had a good day. No, amen. Amen. Now, when we keep reading right here, Jesus said that he'll never leave you and he won't abandon you, which is a huge blessing. This verse is companion to Matthew 28, the last verse in Matthew 28. So these are the two standard passages about Jesus never leaving you and he'll always be with you till the end. Matthew 28. Verse 20, Matthew chapter 28, verse 20. This is what Jesus said, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. So that's encouraging. Jesus Christ will always be with us till the end. That's companion to Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5. These are the two verses that are probably the favorite, uh, one of the favorite pr promised passages of the Word of God that you want to keep in mind. Okay, so we've uh, learned a lot right here about covetousness. And this time, you have to, again, two things. Conversation means what you say. So be careful what you say. All right, what you keep in here, it's eventually going to pop out. People are going to know. All right, you can't hide it forever. Number two, when they look at your manner of living, it's evident that they could see covetousness or contentment, see? They could, it's evident from the way you live, they could see you're satisfied or you're sad because of something. See, so be careful of this sin. This is a very grievous sin, which makes a lot of sense why God put that in the original Ten Commandments. A lot of people don't realize this sin is more sick, more serious than we think. It makes us very miserable in our way of living. It hurts us. Now, when we go to verse 6, I'm going to show you something amazing here that shows how powerful this contentment is, this satisfaction with Jesus. Verse 6, so that we, we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. Okay, we can boldly say, we can bravely say, God is my helper. Why? Because Jesus said, I'll never leave you nor abandon you. 
Because of that confidence, that assurance, we can be bold against this world and say that God's going to help me no matter what problem I go through. And I will not fear what man shall do unto me. So I won't be afraid what people around me are going to do to me. Amen. Now, uh, this is companion to Psalm 27.1. Psalm 27.1. And Dr. Upman mentions that this is one of the verses that should be memorized. Go to Psalm 27 and then we'll read verse 1. So because God is always with us and he's our helper, we don't have to fear what mankind will do to us. So notice the benefit of this promise where Jesus said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. One, it's contentment. Two, it's satisfaction. And three, it's uh, assurance, no fear. No fear. For a nation who has so much, why is it one of the most fearful nations? <laughs> Why is it the people who have mental breakdowns and fear, fear, paranoia all the time? You got security. You got national security. You're in one of the top nations in the world and you got everything and you're living every day in fear. That's the pitfall what happens from covetousness, see? That's a pitfall from what happens from having too much and you're not satisfied in Jesus Christ. You're not content with him. Uh, Psalm 118 and Psalm 27. Go to chapter 118 as well. But let's look at verse 1 of Psalm 27. 1. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Psalm 118. Verse 6. Verse 6. Psalm 118. Verse 6. Bible says, The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do unto me? Well, let's be skeptical here. Let's be real here. Well, uh, plenty what man can do. You ever heard about the Inquisition? You ever ha heard about uh, those women whose breasts got torn because of those uh, pincers or whatever? Pregnant mothers whose babies were torn from their stomachs, fed to the wild hogs to be eaten? Men who hazarded their lives for Jesus Christ and they were burned for hours, being slowly roasted. Missionaries who went to dark continents and then were eaten up by cannibals and slowly roasted and tortured. Oh, there's plenty you can think of what man can do. What man can do to man is a terrifying thing. Man is, mankind can be so evil, they can be so frightful, what man can do. Man can even sprinkle water, so-called holy water, on an iron coffin maiden filled with spikes, throw one of the people inside there, and bless it for the name of Jesus. That's how messed up mankind is. It's so dark and horrible what man can do to mankind. And yet, <laughs> that's weird. I mean, Hebrews 13 insists... How can I fear what man can do to me? Combined with contentment and satisfaction. Come on, man. Let's be skeptical. Let's be real here. That don't make sense. Go to Romans 8 and Matthew 10. Go to Romans 8, Matthew 10. Matthew 10 and Romans 8. Now notice what Jesus Christ says. There's a reason why we do not fear man, all right? So let me give you a few factors that might help you. That way you can stay. Contentment is connected to the fear of the Lord. You notice that? Or no fear of man. That's why a lot of fear comes out. If you have a worry problem, you have to look at your contentment issue. That's what I really believe. A lot of it has to do with you're not content, you're not satisfied. That's why a lot of fear comes out. Contentment comes from no fear. And there is no fear because we are satisfied that I have Jesus Christ. 
Jesus is forever. Because I have Jesus Christ with me, why should I fear mankind? Well, there's plenty to fear. What good will Jesus do when they're uh, tearing bits and pieces off from your nails and then your toes and then your pieces of your feet after that? I mean, what good will Jesus do, right? So there are several factors that will help you understand. One is the fear of the Lord, believe it or not. To not fear man, listen, to not fear man, to have a problem, I mean, to have, uh, to, uh, what's the wording? To have no problem with fear, there's the wording. To have no problem with fear, you've got to have the fear of the Lord. People think that to have no fear means simply that you're always comfortable and there is not an ounce of fear in your body. But when you live your life that way, that's unrealistic. You're gonna be afraid of something eventually. What will help cast out that fear is a bigger fear. And that bigger fear is the fear of the Lord. So because you fear him more, what happens is all these other things that you're afraid of seems to be very little in comparison. Amen. So in Matthew chapter 10, notice what, uh, God says right here in verse, he comforts them. He comforts them in verse 16. Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to the councils and they will scourge you in their synagogue. See that persecution, that torture? Verse 21, and the brother shall deliver up the brother to death and the father, the child and the children shall rise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. Well, that sounds very comforting, don't it? <laughs> that sounds very comforting. Well, uh, we keep reading on in verse 26. Fear them not therefore, for there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed and uh, hid that shall not be known. So Jesus is now comforting you. Don't fear them, no matter how much they harm your body. Look at verse 29. Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing, and one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father? But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear ye not, therefore, ye are of more value than many sparrows. Well, that's comforting. So God actually... If, he, uh, if he's in care over sparrows and birds and you're more valuable than them, that's how much he cares about you. But what does that have to do with, um, how is that comforting when man, mankind is torturing you and killing you? Here's the answer, verse 28. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. There's your comfort. There's your answer. Well, that don't sound comforting. <laughs> well, actually it is. So here's the idea. You're afraid of what man will do to your body? I have a question. Aren't you afraid of what God will do with your body? It says fear him that's able to destroy both body and soul. See that? Now, if you're afraid of what mankind will do with your body, shouldn't you be afraid of what God can do with, with your body? <laughs> That's something to think about. Also, the reason why we don't have to fear man is because we know they have no power over our soul. Our soul will still be intact. Our soul will still be on our own. And they'll go to heaven after we die. So that's the reason why we're able to live because of the fear of the Lord in body and soul. Now, when we go to Romans 8, that's why when we are like sheep, as Matthew 10 stated, that is slaughtered and persecuted, we can still be in comfort. Romans chapter 8 and verse 35. 
Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come, nor height nor depth nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I don't care how long the world owns your body, tortures your body. You're going to get out. Amen. And they'll never own your soul. You know, uh, all the world can do is just mess up your body. That's it. That's all they'll ever do. But they'll never get the real you. They'll never get the real you. And then, uh, you know, uh, you know why the devil is making your life hell? Because... That's all he could do. All best he could do is just 80 years mess up your life. That's it. And then you're out. He's on borrowed time. <laughs> He's on borrowed time. The only thing that could give him joy is just those 80 years. You got 80 times 80 times 80 times 80 times 80 to rejoice against him. So then it's because of heaven. Heaven makes a full difference. So go to 2 Corinthians. Go to the book of 2 Corinthians, and then we'll go to chapter 4, chapter 4. Chapter 4. Another thing why we can be satisfied in Jesus Christ in spite of the persecution and suffering is, as mentioned, uh, they're not going to get us in the afterlife in heaven, but even more so when you have the comparison at number three with the uh, time span in heaven, eternity and rewards, eternal rewards. Now, that solves the covetousness problem, obviously, right? Because your eternal rewards. Covetousness happens because you're always looking at temporary rewards. Right. This also solves the fear factor. Why? Because no matter how bad your affliction is, this thing makes up for it. I promise you this. No, uh, no matter how bad your life is, heaven is so good, it's going to zap out any bitterness that you have against God. Do you think Job, with his double blessing, and Job had it worse than you and I, do you think Job, in his double blessing, after living one year of that, he's still bitter and mad at God? <laughs> See that? So, I mean, I, I, pretty much just one day in heaven is just going to, we're going to forget everything what we suffered. Amen. It's just going to make up for it. God, uh, I have a thing or two I, I got to say to you. <laughs> You try, buddy. You try. You can't help but smile when you're in heaven. You're going to hate yourself for smiling, and you're going to hate yourself for being satisfied in heaven because you want to hold on to that vengeance, that complaint, that bitterness for so long. People want to die with grudges in their heart. You know that? Good luck in heaven. <laughs> you're going to be miserable because you're just going to feel so much joy that it's going to be a hard time holding on to your grudge. <laughs> Verse 17, 2 Corinthians 4, 17. For our light, see that? Light, affliction. But it's bad what man can, mankind can do. But it's still light in comparison. Because which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight and glory. Weight of glory. And by the way, the pain that you feel on this earth, God has to reward you more for that. You know that? Every time they persecute you, it's building up rewards. No Christian wants to go through suffering. I get that. But trust me, when God shows you all the rewards from your suffering, I think you want to cling on to that. Oh, I thought you didn't want suffering, so maybe I'll take away those rewards. Oh, no, 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 God, I take that back. A couple more weeks suffering wouldn't kill me. God, uh, by the way, here's another one. You, you want to hear this part? Maybe your Christian walk is so lousy that maybe the suffering will make up most of the rewards at the judgment seat. Right, good. 
Yeah, you feel encouraged after this? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, let's go back to Hebrews 13. Let's go to Hebrews 13. Uh, listen, I'll take whatever I can, okay? I'm not confident in my abilities and my work for the Lord. I'll take whatever... Uh, I'll take whatever God gives to me so I can get something, some reward out of heaven. The Lord is my helper, and I will not fear uh, what man shall do unto me, because we have it so much better through Jesus Christ. That sure makes up uh, for the fear, and uh, we don't have to be afraid. The last one I want to add is 2 Corinthians 12. Go there. He gives you grace. He gives you grace to endure. A lot of you have heard about dying grace. A lot of you have heard about those martyrs, how they had the grace to endure through that fiery pain. A lot of them, it, it was painless. There was a good report, number of reports where it was painless to them when they were going through that. What is that? That's an example of God's grace on them where they can endure it. So the reason, so think about it. Where does this grace come from, though? It comes from Jesus Christ. Amen. That's why you have to understand this. When you and I have Jesus Christ, then that means we also receive the grace to endure from him. What that means is we have eternal rewards because of him. What that means is you and I have heaven for the afterlife because we have him. Having Jesus means that because of that, the, the world does not own my body and soul. God does. What that means that I have Jesus Christ is the entire universe, time span, and all the blessings and everything in this life. There's so much to gain when, when I have just Jesus Christ. Do you understand? That's why the author is arguing, be content with what you have. And don't fear what man will do to you because Jesus said that I will never leave you nor forsake you and you have him. Amen. See, that's a huge bonus to understand. Now, when we look at uh, Hebrews, uh, uh, 2 Corinthians 12, and you know that verse, but some of you who don't know, let me read it to you. Look at this. Paul is talking about persecution and suffering, but he takes pleasure. Yeah. Pleasure. <laughs> Did you hear what I said? He, had, he takes pleasure in the suffering. Why? Because he's got the grace to endure it, to receive it. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. And he, said unto the, uh, and he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure. See that? In infirmities, do you take pleasure with your health problems? I take pleasure in reproaches. Do you take pleasure when people poke fun at you and criticize your family, forsake you? In necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. Amen. That's why you're not happy and you live in a miserable life of covetousness. It's the American prosperity life that makes us miserable. But even during suffering, you can maintain the joy and the preference. Look, look, Paul said at verse 8, he begged God, he prayed for God to get rid of the suffering. But in verse 10, he decided to choose to cling on to the suffering. That's powerful. This is extremely powerful here. All of this comes from what? Not just God's grace that he gives to you to endure. It's more so than that, because you have Jesus Christ. All, look, listen, it is so true. The song goes, you can have this world, but give me Jesus. There's a huge truth behind that song. Because Jesus is everything to me. That, he means that literally. It is literally everything. Solves all the problems in life. Man, praise the Lord. All right, let's go to Hebrews 13. I spent a long time on that. And uh, we'll close it off uh, right here, actually. We'll close it off right here. I only covered these two verses. But I cover basically the problems of American culture here, and I'm glad. Uh, it has become the norm. 
But verse 4 and 5 destroys the American norm. If you go by the scriptures of verse 4 and 5, you will have a much more happy life, a much more successful marriage and family life. But to have the typical American selfish thinking, then you're going to live the rest of your day miserable. Now, I would like all of you to end your Wednesday night satisfied. Father God, I pray that tonight's teaching has been a blessing to the hearers. Lord, you've given us so much, so much because of Jesus. That's all we need, Father. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you that he's a part of my life. And that no man can pluck me out of his hand. Lord, uh, now I'm stuck with all the blessings and the riches and everything that you can give. I just need to take advantage of it and not waste it. I pray that all of us will do so tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.